Hi, this is Julia Lundstrom, your neuroscience and brain health educator. And on the, this Simple Smart Science video series, I'm very thrilled to be chatting with an extraordinary man today. He's the founder of the 500,000 plus member community called Food Revolution Network. It's one of the largest communities of healthy eating advocates on the planet. He's on a mission to transform the industrialized food culture into one that celebrates and supports healthy people and a healthy planet. And he's inviting you to join the food revolution with his brand new book, 31 Day Food Revolution. He's here today to talk about how food isn't just a path to your health, but a way to build a healthy, sustainable world for everyone to live in. And I know most of us don't think of that when we're thinking about food. We all hear food is fuel for our bodies, but Ocean shares with us how food is actually a fuel for disease as well. So it's time for a food revolution, and he's gonna share with you how you can get your copy of the 31 Day Food Revolution today before it ever gets released to the public on February 5th. And so with that, a big welcome for Ocean Robbins. Thank you so much. I am just thrilled to be with you and to be in this conversation about health and food and brain science and how we can put it all to work for health. Awesome. Well, I'm so grateful you're here speaking to us today. I talk so much about food when it comes to improving people's memories and their brain health. Um, and now you've written, uh, you've written so much about food and diets. What was the spark that drove you to write this particular book, The 31 Day Food Revolution? Well, I've been passionate about food my whole life. Uh, as I think you may know, my grandpa founded Baskin Robbins. Mm -hmm. My dad, John, grew up with an ice cream cone shaped swimming pool in the backyard and 31 flavors of ice cream in the freezer. He was groomed from early childhood to one day join in, in running the family company. But when he was in his early 20s, he was offered that chance and he said no. And he walked away from a path that was practically paved with gold and ice cream to follow his own rocky road, as we say in our family. <laughs> and I uh, went on to become a best-selling author, writing books like Diet for New America, which inspired millions of people to look at food as a chance to make a difference in the world. And um, the media called him the rebel without a cone. And, and as it happens, one of his readers ended up being my grandpa, who was practically on death's door with serious heart disease and weight issues and type 2 diabetes and his doctors told him he didn't have long to live. His cardiologist gave him a copy of my dad's book. My grandpa read it. He made changes. He gave up ice cream. He gave up sugar. He ate a lot more whole plant foods, less animal products. He got results. He got off all of his diabetes and blood pressure medications that he no longer needed. His golf game improved seven strokes. He was one happy camper. He, he later credited my dad's work with saving his life. So we've seen in our family that when we eat the standard American diet, we get the standard American diseases, which eventually can lead to the standard American death. But we've also seen what, what happens when we make a change. So in my life, I traveled the world working with leaders, starting as a teenager, empowering them to be positive activists for change. I worked with leaders in over 65 countries, hundreds of thousands of people in person. And as I traveled the globe, I saw that everyone eats and that what we're eating is having this huge impact. And I saw that as the American way of producing food with agrochemicals and pesticides and factory farms and the American way of marketing with companies like KFC and McDonald's and Baskin Robbins, I saw that these were spreading around the globe. And as, that, as they were spreading, waistlines were expanding and hospitals were filling up and more and more people were getting sick. And I said, gosh, I want to focus on food directly because I see what a huge impact it has. So in 2012, I joined with my dad in launching Food Revolution Network. And uh, we've reached um, you know, millions of people at this point, uh, empowering people to look at food as a chance to make a difference in the world. So all that circles back to 31 Day Food Revolution. I have a copy right here. And why did I write this? Because for so many people, the biggest problem isn't knowing what to do, it's doing what we know. You know, if all that was needed was to know that we need to eat more vegetables and less sugar and processed junk, we would not have an obesity epidemic in America. We would not have a diabetes epidemic. And millions of our elders wouldn't be dying of Alzheimer's right now. But because in so many cases, there is this gap between knowledge and action, I wanted to bridge that gap. So 31 Day Food Revolution is all about how you can take advantage of the results of tens of thousands of studies published in peer-reviewed medical journals so you can get results in your life. So that's why every one of the 31 chapters ends with action steps you can take 
I say in the long run, there are 31 steps to health that can give you more satisfaction even than 31 flavors of ice cream. I was going to say, is this a spin on the 31 flavors of ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> you bet it is. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, my grandpa said there should be more than chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla. And I say that uh, there should be more than guilt and blame uh, when it comes to food choices. We need empowerment and action and results. And so that's why I'm showing you how you can get those results in your everyday life. Yeah, and I love the action plans because I've been thinking so much lately. Um, I, I have nine pillars of brain health and it's so much information. And especially when it comes to the food side to take in and to kind of plan for and how to live your life healthily. And I think a lot of it is kind of helping people figure out how they can fit it into their lives. So like you said, they know what to do, but how right. do I fit this into my life when it's so hectic and I'm always late and the kids have to go here and here and here and I, I have no time to do this and make this and I, the McDonald's is the logical choice. So I think that action plan on the back of each chapter is genius because it really helps people kind of take a step back and look at the, the top level and how am I going to implement this? You know, that's right. That's right. Exactly. Yep. It's all about what you do. At the end of the day, cancer doesn't care how much you know, how many podcasts you watch, how many books you read, but it does care what you eat and how you live. I love and, that. Uh, I'm here to say that uh, with your food choices, you can cast a vote for the health you want and for the world you want. And when you make that a conscious vote, you can get incredible results. Well, I think that leads into, I know you have four distinct parts of your book right and one of them is making that choice but if you could just kind of give us a an overview of the four different parts and maybe some some you know what they're going to get out of the four different parts of the book absolutely so part one of 31 day food revolution focuses on how you can detoxify how you can get rid of the bad stuff that might be making you sick and we look at the foods that have been proven to contribute to higher rates of cancer and heart disease and type 2 diabetes and obesity and and making you feel like crap and we also look at how you can create sustainable habit change habit change and set yourself up for success and i go beyond just food because toxins don't just come in through our food although that's a huge part but also our water our air our food storage containers, plastic, turns out to be incredibly dangerous. A lot of what we cook with, cookware, may actually be toxic. Uh, and so I show how you can understand what's in your kitchen right now and clear out the bad stuff so you can make room for the good stuff. And then in part two, nourish, we look at how you can saturate your body with the fabulous micronutrients that have been proven in study after study to fight cancer and heart disease and to boost brain health and to help you thrive. And then in part three, gather, we look at the social environment. You know, we aren't just a bunch of lone wolves. How we eat is, is profoundly intertwined with our community, with our web of relationships. And a lot of people that I know feel a fundamental sense of loneliness in the modern world. Like there's this kind of isolation. There's so many people on the planet, but a lot of us feel very alone. And so what I want to do is show you how you can actually leverage food to break bread together, to build positive social connections that both support you in making healthy, fabulous food choices, but also deepen your social relatedness. You know, loneliness can go faster than cigarettes. There's no reason anyone needs to be lonely, but why not actually make friends that are on your side, that'll support you and uplift you and call you forward and bring out the best in you. So in, in part three, we look at that and give very practical, simple tips and tools that are proven that other people have done. Uh, we, we surveyed our members. We gathered hundreds and hundreds of stories of real life examples of things people have done that have worked. And I tell those stories and I help you get results. And then in part four, we look at transform. It's how you can change the food world and how you can actually vote for a more healthy, a more sustainable planet for future generations simply and easily with your knife and fork. And I'll tell you what, the spoiler alert here, here is that it's a whole lot easier to change the world for the better than you probably ever imagined. I, I think that's very true. I just saw a recap on the good things that happened in 2018. And for the first time, we actually planted more trees than were deforested. And those are the things you never hear about. But I love the, f the food sustainability piece and the, the making choices with your dollars, because that's not something I've really thought too much about until maybe this last year. And I just had a conversation with um, we have a foreign exchange student staying with us right now that's 18 from the Canary Islands. And he loves his soy milk. And so I kind of talked to him a little bit about soy milk and the alternatives. And of course, he's looking at almond milk. And I'm thinking it's even, you know, for the, for the environment, we look at how much water it takes to grow the almonds, to make the almond milk, things like that. Like, those yeah, are all yeah. 
consider it's not just about what goes in your body. It's also about what's good for the environment and, you know, drought. I'm in California. We've been in drought forever. And, you know, you kind of have to piece me all that together, which of course makes it even more complicated to decide what to eat, what's good for your body and the environment. So I'm so happy you're, you're putting this together. What would you say is one of the, the biggest problems that comes to the environmental factors and impact with food? Well, I, I think that uh, the big thing is that, first of all, to know that there is a huge impact. And I want to just make sure everyone joining us right now is aware that um, we are in a bit of a crisis on a few levels uh, with some issues that are profoundly impacted by the food we eat. First, let's talk um, topsoil for a second. We're losing topsoil at an alarming rate, and it's, it's washing away into our water supplies. And it's because of unsustainable farming practices. But the, the impact of this is tremendous because uh, UN researchers are estimating that by the year 2050, the amount of arable land on the planet to grow food for humans will be half what it was in 1950. So that's, that's a 50% drop in 100 years with a population that will have you know, more than doubled during that same time span. So uh, that, that's pretty alarming if you think about it. Um, and it puts increasing pressure on the topsoil we have left. Uh, which sometimes fuels farmers to get even more unsustainable. So, um, and then water is another big issue because billions of people right now are dependent on aquifers for their water supply. These are like nature storage banks. We're depleting our savings accounts every time we draw from them. And uh, most humans on the planet today are living in ecosystems that do not actually provide as much water as they're, they're using. And the biggest driver of water consumption is agriculture. Uh, and then, of course, climate change is also increasingly unstable, and that leads to droughts in some places and floods in others and mass migration of humans um, because of the, very, the rising sea levels. And all of this can directly impact our ability to grow food uh, for human beings as well. So you put all this together, and I think we face some significant and alarming concerns a generation or two downstream for the ability to feed humanity. So what's the good news? Because there seriously is good news here. So let me get to that. Um, when we eat lower on the food chain, quite frankly, that's the biggest step we can take towards helping to preserve our topsoil, preserve our water supply, and uh, stabilize our climate. Uh, cows impact our climate more than cars do. And uh, it takes about 2,000 gallons of water to produce one pound of feedlot beef in the United States today. It takes about 12 pounds of grain or soy to produce a pound of feedlot beef in the United States today. So basically we're taking large amounts of land and using it and water and topsoil and using it uh, to grow grain and soy so we can feed to our livestock. They're like a protein factory in reverse. They're taking our uh, precious biomass and turning it into flesh and but they're also making hoof and hide and bones and feathers and using it up as energy and turning, creating a lot of manure and all of that is actually taking precious food and turning it into something you know that we have to either dispose of or that's wasted and um, so this is a serious problem but the good news is we can do something about it when you eat lower on the food chain you can actually make a huge impact they, there was a study done which found that people driving a prius who were eating the standard american diet um, would have more net carbon impact than people who were driving a hummer eating a plant-based diet so, uh, you know, obviously, hopefully you don't need to drive a Hummer either, but if you're caring about the planet, the number one thing you can do is eat less animal products. And that has an impact on water, on topsoil, on arable land available to grow food for humans, which becomes more and more important as we move into the future and, of course, on our climate. Yeah, and I, I study a lot about the blue zones and yeah. which are the areas of the earth, right, that for those that don't know, that have... Um, the longest average age of other any other areas on earth, usually over a hundred years old. And one of it is the reduced animal protein intake, which is incredible. Now they deal, do, most of them still do eat protein, animal protein, but it's like five times a month. It's not- Right, exactly. Day, right? Yeah. yeah, you know, you know, when you look at the blue zones, uh, there are actually six of them that Dan Buechner studied for National Geographic. And um, in uh, five of them, they eat between zero and 10%, or maybe five and 10% of their calories come from animal products. And mm -hmm. in one of them, Loma Linda, California, it's basically zero because they're right. mostly right. vegan um, or, or vegetarian. And um, uh, when you look at the average American diet, we get it, we're getting 34% of our calories from animal products. 
So we could argue till the cows come home, literally, about whether the optimal diet for humans is 0% or 5% or 10%. But we have so many medical studies showing us pretty clearly that, uh, that eating a lot less animal products is the way to go. And I think that's, that's the big picture point here. And if you are going to eat animal products, then that they be pasture raised, that they come from animals that got to see the sun and move around and we're not pumped full of antibiotics and hormones mm -hmm. is pretty darn important as well because the factory farming system is not only cruel to animals, but it's breeding antibiotic resistant bacteria that threaten the viability of antibiotics for future mm -hmm. generations of humans. They're also uh, producing a tremendous amount of environmental pollution and waste. And so we can help turn that around also by eating less meat. And if you're going to eat meat, going for better meat. I think that's a really good point. You know, it's not all about just being vegetarianism, although that may be the best move. Um, but it's really about eating less meat and then eating the right kinds of meat. Right. Yeah. So let's go into I know you already shared the story of your family and your dad, which is amazing. And your grandpa's transformation and my dad recently had a transformation like that with kidney disease this year and awesome. his diet. I yeah. got off of dialysis actually from changing his diet, which it's only like 0.2% of people that can do that. Um, so I'm such a firm believer in this and I just applaud you for doing this work. But since you started working with your dad in 2012, what has been your favorite transformational story that you've heard? Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, one of my top favorites is Kate McGowie Smith. Kate is in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, she was uh, in really bad shape um, about 10 years ago. Kate was uh, suffering from a, such severe type 2 diabetes that she had gone blind. Uh, wow. She was confined to a wheelchair. She was unable to walk and she couldn't see. And, um, and her kidneys had ceased to function properly. And she was on the verge of needing kidney dialysis. And her doctor basically told her, I'm sorry, Kate, the best thing I can advise you to do is to have a good will because your kids, she had three little kids at home. She said, oh. they're probably not going to have their mom around for much longer. I just want to be level with you. It's not a good situation. And um, Kate was obviously not happy about that. And she wound up um, researching, learning about whole foods, plant-based diet and applying it. So she, she, she went radical because her life was on the line. So she gave up all animal products, all sweets, all flour products, all sugar forms, and um, all bottled oils. She snacked on steamed greens with vinegar, flavored vinegars, uh, six times a day. She ate a ton of fruits and vegetables, and she got the results that we often see for this type of situation. She, uh, she taught herself to cook, by the way, while blind and confined to a wheelchair. Oh my gosh. And, um, and oh, I, within a couple of years, she got her eyesight back. And, she got her eyesight back. And then she was able That's to walk awesome. again. And now she's hiking. And she's become a health educator. And she can see. And she lost 70 pounds. And um, she has her life back. She still only has 12% kidney function. But she hasn't needed dialysis. And her doctors are stunned. Because mm -hmm. she, she, she's making such, eating such a healthy diet that 12% is, is adequate <laughs> to keep her going. Um, she said to me that she, she still doesn't know. Her body's been through a lot, and she doesn't know for sure how long she'll live, although she hopes to have a good, long, healthy life. But she, and she doesn't have a lot of money, and she often reflects about what she's leaving for her kids. And this whole process um, has inspired uh, her to really look at what life's about. And she said, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to leave them something so much better than money, which is health and the knowledge of what health can do for us and how food matters. One of her sons uh, was also morbidly obese. He's lost 70 pounds. Her husband has lost 50 pounds. Her whole family has gotten so much healthier. And so Kate is living with the knowledge that not only has her transformation impacted her life, but it's enabled her kids to have a mother and to have greater health themselves and her husband as well. And uh, now she educates other people about health and is a health educator and coach. And, you know, she's one of my heroes, to be honest with you. I can get sometimes complain and mope about all sorts of things. I suppose we all can. And, and then I think about Kate snacking on, you know, steamed greens with vinegar six times a day and, and teaching herself to cook while blind and confined to a wheelchair. Oh, and hooked up to a 30 pound oxygen tank in order to breathe, by the way. And she's reversed all that now. But I think about what a, what a courage it took for her to undergo that transformation when 
even her own doctor told her there was, really wasn't any hope. And, um, you know, it gives, I think it gives hope to all of us. Yeah, absolutely. I love Kate's story. And that brings up a, a good point about her doctors, because I, my dad's doctor is the same thing. They told him he didn't need to change his diet, even though he was going through, chron you know, chronic kidney disease and kidney failure. So what do you think it is in our culture and our, you talk about how doctors only have 19 hours of nutrition through how many years of medical school. Why do you, what is it in our culture that it just doesn't make it important for them to learn it? Well, um, it's true. So less than a third of the medical schools in the United States have a single required course in nutrition. Uh, there are only five out of 140 or so medical schools in the U.S. that even have a nutrition department or dedicated faculty at all. So we really have a medical or a health system that acts like food didn't matter. And of course, we have a food system that for the most part acts like health didn't matter. Um, why do doctors not pay more attention to food? Well, of course, they didn't learn about it. That The National Board of Medical Examiners, which creates the tests that... Um, that um, would be aspiring physicians have to pass in, in order to complete their medical school process and graduate uh, and become licensed. Uh, the National Board of Medical Examiners has uh, virtually no questions on the exams that pertain to food or health. And of course, schools have to teach to the test. So we've, we've been campaigning and petitioning to the National Board of Medical Examiners to add food and nutrition to the tests given to, um, you know, <laughs> aspiring physicians. And um, I think that we ultimately have to face the fact that, that there's no money to be made in helping people be healthy. Um, and so there's no real profit incentive in the medical industry mm -hmm. to address this. Yeah. It, it, I'll tell you, I think that if there was as much money to be made in prescribing broccoli as there was to be, is to be in prescribing chemo, We'd see a lot more broccoli eaten and recommended by doctors. The other challenge is that doctors don't, even those good hearted doctors who want to help their patients haven't been trained in how to help their patients. So mm -hmm. they say, hey, eat a good diet. Good luck with that. You know, and of course, nothing happens because their patients, for the most part, don't know what a good diet is and don't know how to apply it. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, we need, we need courses and programs and trainings and resources so that doctors can have somewhere to send their patients. If you, if you want to send your, give your patients a drug, you send them to the pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Where do you send them if you want to give them healthy eating? There isn't a program like that that's widely available yet, and we need that. Fortunately, on a grassroots level, people are creating alternatives, and organizations like Food Revolution Network are doing so. And honestly, 31 Day Food Revolution is the best answer I've been able to come up with for how to help everybody get those kinds of results in their lives. So, um, you know, I wrote this book specifically because I want to help you apply these insights and get the results you want. Um, and that's, that's, I think, the missing link for so many people. And, and with the funds from the book, you're actually doing something remarkable with low income communities. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. Well, I, I'm sick and tired of this gap along race lines, along class lines pertaining to health. The reality is that statistically, the poorer you are uh, in, on the, in the world right now, the more likely you are to die of hunger, but also to be morbidly obese. The more likely you are to eat either no food or food that is full of processed junk and factory farmed animal products and bottled oil. Statistically, the poorer you are, the more likely you are to suffer from type two diabetes, heart disease, cancer, even Alzheimer's. And I want to do something about that. So uh, for every single new copy of 31 Day Food Revolution that's sold, I'm donating the funds to trees for the future, letting them plant another organic fruit or nut tree in a low-income community. And this is just one small way that we can contribute to helping build a brighter future. So you know that your purchase is actually helping feed a family or a community for the long haul. Oh, that's great. And if they get your book, today before the pre-launch, they get a bunch of different bonuses. Can you run through those real quick? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We created a whole bunch of bonuses. Uh, the Food Revolution Action Collection, which is a collection of interviews with some of the top food experts on the planet that my dad and colleague John Robbins and I conducted. And you get the interview, the transcript, and an action checklist to help you put it all into action in your life. And then you also um, get special reports we put together on water, on top nu nutrients that a lot of plant-based eaters may be deficient in and need to pay attention to. Special reports on um, foods to eat and foods to avoid if you want to be a healthy eater with a whole chart. And 
a lot of other great resources. And we assembled all this and we're giving it away completely for free for everyone who gets 31 Day Food Revolution from 31dayfoodrevolution.com. Again, that's the number 31dayfoodrevolution.com. Or you can go ahead and buy it anywhere from your local bookstore and then come on back to 31dayfoodrevolution.com. Just let, it know, let us know you got it. You can collect all your bonuses as well. Okay, great. Yeah, that one where you talk about what nutrients they need if they're on a vegetarian diet to supplement with, I think is really important, like B12 and yeah. um, omega-3s, things like that. So I, I love that. So yes, um, we will have a link to your book that they can go ahead and buy it. And also it'll talk about all the different bonuses they'll get if they get it before the launch. But you are launching February 5th, correct? Yes. And you can get it anytime you want, depending on when you're hearing this. It might even be after February 5th. But um, but yes, it's uh, you can, it, that there are some special bonuses available before February 5th. And, uh, and there's some great ones after as well. And um, really, this book is just my stake in the ground to say enough is enough of a toxic food culture. I want you to have the ability to take the power into your hands uh, where it belongs because you don't have to be a victim of agrochemical companies or factory farms or junk food companies or the society around us. You get to vote with your knife and fork for the help you want and for the world you want. So thank you for your partnership in this food revolution. Thank you for your participation. And uh, let's do this together. Yeah, very happy to. I'm so happy to be a part of this and support you guys because it is such, especially after my dad this year, such a deep rooted commitment I have to getting this information out there. So thank you for joining us today. It's been a great pleasure and all the best of luck to you and your new book launch. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you, Shin. All right. Well, thank you so much.